thank you very much. In particular, I'd like to thank uh, Jody and Daniel for making it happen that I can be here again. Uh, <coughs> the trip yesterday, well, it had a few obstacles. I told uh, Daniel about this morning, but finally, when I came into Kursak, it was, I felt like coming home. It was really, it was a great feeling. Well, I still have it in here, so. Uh, okay, so uh, <coughs> um, science and fiction, or science and science fiction. Uh, I changed the title a little bit to An Unequal Affair, because I think that's more uh, what it uh, looks to me. Um, the talk will be completely different, I think, in attitude than the talk we heard from Peter. And uh, I'm afraid that I can by far not come up to these standards. Uh, it will not be about climate change. I'm a scientist, so I'm more on this, uh, well, let's say, not on this spectacular side. As you said, the scientists, they check and review and 95% at least and so on and so on. So it's more of a, I, I thought a little bit about the relationship between science and science fiction. That was <coughs> when I heard that this um, workshop will be here in Kursak and I didn't have an idea what to talk about and then I came up with this. Okay, so uh, <coughs> science and science fiction. Uh, I said unequal affair uh, in the sense that I think they love each other and they hate each other in a certain way. And the word hate has to be taken with care here. I think it's more the kind of hate which you have when your kid's playing football again in the living room. It's not the hate really. It's, it's, you still love the kid, right? But it's, it's that moment you feel maybe a little bit aggressive. So it's not the hate in the strong sense. Now, <coughs> why do they love each other? I think they love each other, at least it's my opinion from the scientist's point of view, because for <coughs> the mutual inspiration, and I think there is an inspiration on both sides, definitely an inspiration for the scientist from science fiction, but now I'm trespassing a little in the sense Daniel sent this one of the first, I think, invitations around where you mentioned trespassing, epistemic trespassing. Uh, <coughs> I'm not a science fiction writer. I like to read science fiction. I actually, I must say, after I heard that I was invited to this workshop, I started to read some of Peter's novels and novellas. Is that correct? One, one novella, right? <laughs> and. <coughs> But as I said, I do a little bit of trespassing by, by uh, um, now claiming that I think that it's also from the science fiction point of view that there is an inspiration from science. And what about the hate? Well, the hate is unequal in a certain way. Um, <coughs> maybe, I don't know, that, that's the hate which I said before. Maybe it's that uh, science put certain constraints and rules to our fantasy, um, at least sometimes. And I will mention some of these later. Uh, <coughs> and the other way around is, if science fiction violate these rules, at least I, as a scientist, when I read science fiction, and when these rules are violated, this for me is not good science fiction anymore. <laughs> Um, <coughs> so, I mean, to give you an example, one of the rules is the speed of light in vacuum is, is uh, let's say, a maximum speed for traveling and um, most science fiction, good science fiction at least, stick to that rule. Um, they not bluntly say, well, we move with 5,000 times the velocity of light. Uh, they find other ways around and that's, that's the inspiring part for science then. Uh, <coughs> But if you have, let's say, some cheap science fiction claiming that, well, they have a spaceship would move with 
6,000 times the velocity of light, um, then it's something like which science doesn't like, of course. Okay, we had three disciplines, I think, mentioned in the announcement. There is science, and I think in this um, <coughs> configuration, science somehow sets the rules and sets the constraints in a certain way. Scientific rules and scientific constraints. Now, what science fiction does, in my opinion, is that it places a fictitious story in the possible reality, but within these boundaries of science, and in particular, and that's where the, the creative, the fantasy part enters, I think, using the loopholes, which the constraints and the scientific insights uh, open to the extreme in a certain sense. And this very often, and in particular, I mean, uh, Peter mentioned that one of his books is recommended for the neuroscience classes and philosophy classes on consciousness and uh, neuroscience and so on. <coughs> it leads to very fundamental questions about what is reality, what is consciousness, what is life, what is humanity, <coughs> what are humans, um, Peter's blind side raises this question, what are humans all the time? I mean, the book is more to a certain extent about that, as far as I understand it. What are values, etc. So this is how I see, from a scientific point of view, the science fiction part. Well, and then we have the social sciences, and what, one of the questions here is, I think, the social sciences can ask is, do we want such a society which is described in here? Do we want it? If we want it, what can we do to realize it? If we don't want it, what can we do now to, to go against it? But um, one thing I forgot to mention here on the slides, which uh, <coughs> I just thought about, uh, yesterday, I recently read um, a science fiction story by the Chinese science fiction writer uh, Liu Qixing, uh, The Three-Body Problem. I don't know how many of you know it. And there's a very interesting social aspect in that book, because um, just to make the story short, there is a threatening from some alien intelligence which people on Earth know they will come to Earth and reach Earth in about 40 years. So they know in about 40 years <laughs> this foreign intelligence will be here. And then there is an interesting social, or are interesting social movements and one of them is that people start to believe, yes, it's only a foreign intelligence which can save our planet. We ourselves are no longer able to do it. So we should do everything to, to help these foreign invaders to get to Earth, to prepare Earth for them, and that they can take over. And I think this is a social question. I mean, it's particularly interesting from a Chinese writer. Only a foreign intelligence or alien intelligence can save the world. So um, <coughs> in that sense, there are many social aspects also entering science fiction. Now, <coughs> coming back to <coughs> the main, or my main, uh, 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 subject. So what is the back, back reaction of science fiction onto science? Uh, <coughs> science usually has an object and uh, it tries to figure out how it works. By object I mean some physical system or so, or some biological system, or whatever. And they try to figure out how it works. Now science fiction uses these insights to invent then objects which in principle could exist according to these rules. 
And this I found very interesting. Again, I mentioned Peter's works. Uh, <coughs> you mentioned the Porsche, the spider, jumping spider in the Echopraxia, uh, <coughs> which has an incredibly small brain, uh, <coughs> much less than a million neurons, which is small as compared, for instance, to humans who have, well, 13 billion, roughly, of that order of magnitude. And still, this spider is capable of something which many, many more advanced animals are not. It's capable of kind of planning to how to approach its prey in the best way, and then even to withdraw, and such that its prey is no longer in its sight, and to make a route along a path and approach the prey from another side. And I mean, if you think about it, this is really a, a high task, uh, uh, <coughs> or some high task to, to, to withdraw from, from your prey. So you don't see it anymore, but you have to have a representation of it in your mind, somehow, or in your brain, I shouldn't say mind, to then find a different route and approach it from a different side. So people were wondering how that works, and um, there were some theories, and it's very nice then how Peter made that theory work into this alien object, uh, <coughs> which uh, developed a brain which is not maybe very large, or does not consist of many neurons, but it doesn't have to, as long as there's enough time. Usually we don't have time to evaluate things. We have to react very fast, but under some conditions we do have time. And then we can, well, let's say, skip the parallel processing, make it into a serial processing, and then we don't need so many neurons to solve tasks. And obviously there exist certain um, organisms on Earth which do have this property. I didn't know about them before I read Peter's books. And so it's very interesting to, to use these insights then um, <coughs> to think about how could possible alien creatures look like. The back reaction is then that the scientists ask why not or how. So why is it not or can it not be that way? That's one possibility. But in most cases, how can it be like this? And that's something <laughs> which happened quite often in science. And uh, one of the best known examples maybe is the warp drive. Uh, I was astonished to read that the warp drive was already invented in 1931. Uh, I wouldn't have thought about that. 1931, I mean that was the theory of general relativity was well, the paper, the famous... in order to describe these things. But when something becomes infinite, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is something happening. I mean, if you look at a map of the Earth, let's say it, a map which represents all of the globe. You sometimes see these maps. On these maps, there is a singularity on the North Pole and the South Pole because essentially one single point is stretched to a line. And if you approach this point, the distance, let's say, which you have one centimeter on your map, and now you approach the North Pole, becomes essentially zero, because it's all contracted. In reality, it's contracted to one point. So on this map, the North and the South Pole appear as singularities, but when you go to the North Pole, there is nothing singular there. 
So people at that time, in 1931, they didn't know what the horizons of black holes were whether they are real singularities, something is happening there, or whether they are just these spurious singularity because you use a bad map, a bad description for these systems. Around that time, 1931, David Finkelstein, one of the famous physicists working on that theory, figured out that presumably they are not real singularities. But his works got lost was in the 1940s again, 1950s, that people really figured out, no, they are not real singularities. So around that time, when people were still struggling what relativity is about, you already have this idea of a warp drive. Now, <coughs> where did it come from? Now, I think the constraint which comes from physics is no material object, energy, or controlled signal, can travel faster than the speed of light in vacuum. That's something which relativity tells us. We do believe in that, and I think it's a very serious constraint for science fiction. I mean, we have a universe, at least the visible part of the universe is about 13 billion light years, which means if you are restricted to that speed, it takes you 13 billion years to get to these things, which is a little bit too much. It's roughly also, well, not by coincidence, it's, it is uh, <coughs> related. It's the age of the universe. And uh, so this is a serious constraint for all science fiction. But then science fiction authors had this in ingenious ideas to use the rules of, si of relativity in order to circumvent this constraint. And uh, this is what I find most interesting about it. So one of the rules of general relativity is that energy causes space-time to curve. So that's uh, <coughs> what general relativity tells us. And then now the idea for the warp drive essentially is put enough energy in particular places, I say here in front, it's not completely right, uh, <coughs> but into your environment, such that space-time curves in such a way that suddenly the distance to an object which is in front of you gets smaller and the distance behind you gets larger. So this is a kind of picture where <coughs> the blue part shows where the distances get smaller and the red part shows where the distances get larger. And uh, <coughs> so essentially, uh, that means you don't need to exceed the speed of light. You can use the speed of light to travel a distance which ordinarily would be, let's say, a few hundred thousand light years in a few hours because you, you were able to shrink space-time in such a way that uh, the distance became actually smaller. You, have to th you can think of it like a kind of rubber band or rubber sheet where <coughs> you have two points in the rubber sheet and you, enable, you are now able to, to, to stretch the sheet in such a way that the two points come close together, then it's not a big distance anymore and then behind you, you release it again. And in such a way, you travel these distances um, without violating uh, <coughs> the laws of physics. Now, this led scientists to think about, well, is that really possible? And there are indeed many peer-reviewed papers in uh, <coughs> important journals about general relativity which speculate about this warp drive to which extent it's possible. And, uh, <coughs> okay, some come to the conclusion it's only possible if you have something like anti-gravity, which is not forbidden uh, according to, uh, let's say, to at least extended versions of general relativity. But uh, up to now we don't have any uh, indications that something like anti-gravity exists. Other papers come to the conclusion, yes, you can do that. Uh, 
but you need the energy of the whole universe put into a kind of volume which is let's say of the size of your spaceship a little bit larger maybe than the size of the spaceship uh, <coughs> in order to get this curvature in order to to travel let's say from here to the andromeda nebula uh, <coughs> in a few hours but in principle it's possible it's not a violation of uh, the a theory of general relativity anymore. Uh, and I think it's one of the interesting parts for me of science fiction is to, on the one hand, to describe these things in very much detail. On the other hand, maybe they don't care so much about orders of magnitude when it comes to the amount of energy which you need. But then that's the scientific part again for me. So how much energy do you actually need in order to realize a warp drive. As I said, in principle it's possible, and that's the science fiction which I like, where <coughs> in principle the rules are correct, and uh, <coughs> they show us, on the, on the one hand, not only the constraints, but they show us also the possibilities to circumvent these constraints. Another thing which I think Peter mentions in uh, his most recent novella, um, the, uh, <coughs> the freeze frame revolution, is kind of wormhole engineering. Um, <coughs> so indeed, general relativity allows wormholes to exist. So what you have to imagine is that this is a part of the universe, and this here, this bend this stretches maybe billions of light years doesn't matter but comes back you have the feeling on when you are on this part of this of this sheet it's almost flat you're traveling through flat space so when you go through that wormhole from this part to that part in principle you can come up to a completely different part of the universe maybe you can even come up in a different universe uh, <coughs> which otherwise may be billions of light years apart. And uh, indeed, what I've shown here is what is called a Penrose diagram of a rotating black hole. It's not so important now to read this Penrose diagram. Um, <coughs> essentially, every square here on the outside is a whole universe. It represents a whole universe from the side from this uh, <coughs> point of view. It's a map of a whole universe outside the black hole. The squares in here represent the inside of the black hole. And there are squares on the other side which represent, again, whole universes outside the black hole. And in contrast to an ordinary black hole, which has a singularity at the center, and once you cross the horizon, you are inevitably bound to run into that singularity. And there you will torn apart and everything ends. But if you have a rotating black hole, and it's very reasonable to assume that the supermassive the supermassive black hole four million or <coughs> in that sense supermassive it's very reasonable to assume that they are rotating quite fast then the singularity doesn't isn't a point anymore but the singularity becomes a circle and you can travel through the circle it's difficult to imagine unless you go to the equations and what is shown here essentially is a possible world line of uh, who at one stage entered the black hole and now is traveling inside the black hole around this singularity and uh, around this circle, circular singularity. And at some stage it can leave the black hole. And then it ends up in a different universe or it ends up in a different part of our universe. These things do exist. No, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, presumably these things do exist. 
We know that supermassive black holes exist, at least according to all the evidence we have, uh, with more than 95% uh, <coughs> uh, confidence level. We believe that supermassive black holes exist. If they exist, and if the theory of relativity is correct also inside a black hole, I mean, that's also an interesting point of view for me for, as a scientist. We have a theory in which we believe but this theory has a domain which cannot be even tested. We cannot test whether the theory is correct inside a black hole. But we believe it to be correct because it's correct outside the black hole. So we have so many evidence that the theory is correct, at least outside the black hole, that there's a very strong belief that it also remains correct inside a black hole. But in, as I said, we don't have empirical evidence for that. But if the theory is correct also inside the black hole, you can enter these black holes, decide to leave somewhere. Actually, there's an infinite number of copies of it. So a rotating black hole has an infinite number of exits, which you can take, and you end up somewhere. The theory doesn't tell you where. The theory only tells you somewhere. You are outside again. And now, <coughs> We don't have theories up to now uh, how to now combine, let's say, this universe with that universe, so to make a connection from here to here, so that we can enter this universe from here and leave in the same universe, but at a completely different part of it. But in principle, it's possible, and this is what I would call wormhole engineering, so maybe in a few hundred years, we are able to really engineer to connect the entrance here or the exits here with entrances and exits here. And that was a feeling, at least, what you had in mind. I don't know whether you can comment about that. Uh, <coughs> when uh, in, in the freeze frame revolution, uh, uh, that people were somehow connecting wormholes in order to make short paths to different parts of the universe. So, theory of relativity leaves up this possibility. It's not in contradiction to physics, but it's a very interesting idea. Other interesting ideas from physics which have recently been used in science fiction novels, uh, graphene. Um, the name, well, I must say, uh, <coughs> I only have this idea from, from um, or I only found this idea in the three-body problem. There, <coughs> it's, it, the name graphene is never mentioned. Uh, uh, in the three-body problem, it's, uh, they only talk about nanomaterials, but it's very obvious from the, the uh, <coughs> properties of these materials that it's graphene, which is, um <coughs> which is meant here. Graphene is presumably the strongest material which we can even have in the universe uh, <coughs> uh, compared to, let's say, either volume or weight. So if you have a certain, uh, let's say, amount of this material, you can make strings which are stronger than more or less everything else which we know of today. And in the three-body problem, for instance, it is used to make a very, very thin, thin string, which you don't even see, and put it to the left, from the left to the right of the Panama Channel, and then a ship comes, and this string is much sharper than any Japanese sword, so the ship runs simply through that string, uh, without being almost, there's almost no friction, because the string is so thin, but it cuts the, the ship in two and every person on the ship also. And you won't even feel it, presumably. Maybe you sometimes have this feeling when you have a very, very sharp knife and you cut yourself, you don't feel it in the first moment. It's only after a while that you see, oh, I'm bleeding. And uh, <coughs> so these strings are so sharp, and they are principle possible. Uh, so these nanomaterials uh, are an interesting subject maybe for science, or an interesting subject for science fiction.
They are presumably also the only material which make the so-called space elevator, elevator concept uh, realizable. So the space elevator concept is that you have some weight far up in the, well, in space. Now here it's 96,000 uh, <coughs> kilometers. Uh, <coughs> which just stays there, doesn't need any propulsion or whatever. Uh, the uh, centrifugal force is enough to make it stay there. And then you have graphene, which is light enough in order not to draw that back. That's an important thing. <laughs> if you would o use ordinary material, this has a lot of weight. And it would pull that thing down back to Earth. But graphene is so light, nevertheless so strong, that it w this might remain there. And then by using pure centrifugal forces, you can make an elevator going up and down from Earth into space and uh, back. Essentially what it does, that's what people usually don't mention in these boxes, uh, the question is where does the energy come from? It needs energy. And it takes its energy in the end from the rotational energy of the Earth. So over in the long run, the rotation of the Earth would become slower. But it does anyhow because of tidal forces. So uh, <coughs> the tidal uh, uh, forces which we have uh, uh, at the seas, at the coastlines every day, also slow down the rotation of the Earth. We know that a few million years ago, one day was around 23 hours, today it's 24, and uh, <coughs> the difference is due to these tidal forces. And so this would uh, accelerate this so that the Earth would become slower in its rotation. Um, so nanomaterials, I think, uh, will also be an interesting subject for science fiction. Quantum, of course, quantum. I'm a quantum physicist, so quantum is uh, something which entered science fiction, well, maybe during the last 80 years or so. Uh, quantum teleportation, I don't know, some of you may know this, Scotty Beamer's up. I think this is the very old version of Star Trek. Um, <coughs> and uh, yes, quantum teleportation is possible, according to quantum theory. Uh, it has been done by this guy here, Anton Seilinger. He's a physicist from Vienna. And uh, what he did is he quantum teleported a single photon. So it's not very much, but at least it's, it's, it's a start. A single photon from, I don't know from which place to which one, let's say from Tenerife to La Palma, it's a distance of 143 kilometers. Uh, so he showed that in principle it works. You can teleport. <coughs> an object from one place to another. The interesting thing which quantum theory tells us, it's not that you take the photon from here and put it in here. What you do essentially is you destroy the photon here and you create a new one in exactly the same state which the old one had. That's the important thing. So it's exactly the same state of the photon which you destroyed here. So if you imagine to do that with people, it means that every particle in that person is created in exactly the same state as it is destroyed uh, where the person is before, has been before. And quantum theory tells us that you have to destroy the old state. So you cannot make copies. Because that was always a kind of... Uh, 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 <coughs> miracle, uh, at least to some people who, who had, uh, let's say, halfway understood how the teleportation works. In quantum theory, you have to destroy the old object in order to create the new one. So you cannot make copies, which is fine. So you have only one copy of uh, Captain Kirk and so on. Uh, Okay, I think I should stop then. Quantum cryptography, <coughs> okay, I think people have talked about that a lot. 
Quantum scanning, that's something which I'm interested in. I think it has not been used up to now in science fiction. It's a combination of two articles, Measurement Without Interaction by Elitzer and Weidmann, even though the idea is much older, and the second article by, again, Seilinger. And it means that you can scan an object, a brain, without any energy transfer or energy exchange. That means, first of all, the scan system doesn't know that it's scanned because it doesn't feel any interaction. And because there is no energy transfer, you can use objects which are very, very high energetic, for instance, gamma rays, to receive an arbitrary fine resolution. And um, so it means that in the, let's say, not too far future, maybe in 100 or 200 years, you can have scanners where you just walk through, you don't even notice, and your whole brain is scanned up to every particle. Um, which I think would be an interesting idea for some of the science fiction stories. <laughs> okay, parallel universes have been used now uh, in science fiction. <coughs> if you are able to develop a quantum coherence device, not decoherence, but to generate coherence, then it may bring you to other universes. And essentially it works in the same way as a radio where you go through the wavelengths and you choose different channels. And, um, <clears throat> but you have to cohere to the wavelengths of this channel. Okay, coming back to the end, epistemic trespassing. The science have a problem with trespassing, at least physics, either from scientists from other fields, from science fiction or from laymen. I would say no, not much, at least, as they are not fanatics. Well, that's the simple. Um, first of all, my uh, argument is false opinions may also appear within a field of speciality. It's not something which only non-experts do have. Also, the experts have false opinions. But also, false opinions are true beliefs in the sense that they are true for me. So one of the examples given in that article is Linus Pauling and his vitamin C, excessive vitamin C use. He himself believed that it helps. And maybe that already contributed that it did help indeed. In the same way as, for instance, homeopathy might help. And some people swear on it. And uh, <coughs> it doesn't mean that something is wrong it may be something wrong on the science side, but it's not necessarily wrong on the psychological side. If I believe that it works, it might already have a kind of effect. Okay, I will skip that. Um, so let me come to the final, the social aspect, the final social aspect. What I was always wondering about, I mean, this is for me a good example, the 1984 novel by George Orwell. It was written in 19, well, it was written before, 46 to 48, but it appeared in 1949. Now, before 1984, I remember, I'm old enough to remember, we were afraid that such a society will ever come, will ever come true. In 1984, we were happy that it didn't come true, and today we don't care anymore that it's about to come true. And that's for me a very strange phenomenon. I mean, I don't have to go to China, I mean, where it's an extreme. It's in the internet. We don't care that every move we do is more or less uh, <coughs> uh, um, registered somewhere. So that's an interesting, for me, an interesting social aspect. Um, so we might be afraid of future societies painted in science fiction novels, but somehow maybe the next or the next or next generation, they don't care. I don't know. Okay, can science fiction anticipate the future? For me, there's a nice example from Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. Yes, it can. And that brings me to the end of my story. Thank you very much.